<clears throat> so guys, um, <laughs> I, had to, I had a couple of loops in there because I wanted to emphasize a few things that he said. First of all, the fact that he says this is where we came from, uh, the 4,200 year orbit around our sun, and the fact that this object also has another big object that it's toting with it, and it's a solar system within our solar system. So we're living in a binary solar system. We have two suns. One's a brown dwarf star that has planets orbiting it, and the other one is, a, um, is, is the solar system that we have right now with our, our, our white sun in the middle. Now, <clears throat> you know, recently they said they found these, uh, these planets, which you see on the screen now, which are, uh, you know, just 40 light years away, and they orbit a sun in a fashion that would allow them to, to be um, uh, applicable for life. However, that's, that's 40 light years away. We have, we have um, planets right above our head, Mercury, Venus, Mars. We have moons of Saturn. We have the moons of Jupiter. We have right above our heads planets that these Atlanteans visited in ancient times. And I'm going to show you space anomalies from official source data with links that you can track yourself and go to yourself because I always promote self-research. And you will see anomalies, things that don't belong on these particular space bodies. So that's what's the interesting thing. This is, this is evidence that the Atlanteans actually existed. <clears throat> And the thing about it, this is a book cover from Through an Alien Eyes. The thing that's interesting about these Atlantean people, when you research them, you discover that they were all races. They weren't just one race of people. They were red, yellow. They were white, black. Uh, they were blue and green. Uh, and this is well, well, well documented. Even some of them, one of them in one particular case in the Sumerian tablets had married a woman from another planet. This was a mixed race of people uh that came to this planet in ancient times engaged mankind uh and started several ancient cultures around this planet including the atlantean culture the sumerian kings list is one of the oldest accounts of these people on this planet <clears throat> and the sumerian kings list is available in the in the ashmolean museum in oxford england <clears throat> so if you go to the ashmolean museum in oxford england you can go visit the uh, Sumerian Kings list. Most recently, uh, Jaden Smith, Will Smith's son, uh, from time to time I send him to different places around the planet when he's traveling. Uh, they contact me and say, okay, where can I go to learn about uh, ancient civilizations in this particular region of the planet? Uh, when he was traveling out to, to Europe, I sent him to meet one of my guides and took him to the Sumerian Kings list in the Ashmolean Museum which we have some great pictures of that on Anunnaki history on our Facebook group. But um, so the Sumerian Kings, this is some of the oldest evidence. And we're going to go through the Sumerian Kings list right now. This is a, <clears throat> a video that was taken by uh, Dominic Joyce, uh, one of our phenomenal admins on Anunnaki history, uh, when he went to Oxford, England, to the Ashmolean Museum. This is the tablet here that lays down the Kings list, the people that ruled before the Great Flood happened and how many years each one of them ruled. <clears throat> so let's just go through that tablet real quick. I mean, let me see if I have that here. Did I have that here, the, the years they ruled? Let's see. I thought I had that one pulled up. Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll have to pull that one up. That's really interesting. I got, I got to grab that. Uh, I got to grab that real quick, guys. Hold on a second for me. <clears throat> I want to give you the exact amount of years. Let's see here. Like I told you, I have about 280 <laughs> PowerPoints. <clears throat> so from time to time, I get a slide or two mixed up. Let me see here. That was that one. Jump in here real quick. If I don't find it here, I'm going to pull it up for you somewhere else. <clears throat> Excuse me. The right throat. Let's see here. These are my anomalies. Okay. okay hold on one second, guys. I'm going to get the exact ages right. So I don't want to uh, 
mix my words on it. <clears throat> Let me see. The pre flood the pre flood or antediluvian kings on the list reigned for tens of thousands of years, measured in units called shars or sars, nears or sauces. Each one was thirty six hundred years. <clears throat> so basically, one orbit around our sun for them was 3,600 years. They consider that one year, one SAR. <clears throat> now, eight antediluvial kings ruled for 241,200 years according to this Sumerian kings list. The epics measured in tens of thousands of years are reminiscent of the Hindu yugas during which years of peace, chaos, and everything in between represented by cycle ages lasting hundreds of thousands of years. The longest reign of the Sumerian king Emin Luana lasted for 43,200 years. That's one king ruled for 43,200 years, which is oddly similar to the Kali Yuga lasting 432,000. The number 432 is an auspicious number in mysticism and has in, also in many ancient cultures as well. Uh, the eight kings in total ruled for 241,200 years on the Inumi Elish, I'm, I'm sorry, on the Sumerian kings list. And this is uh, an image of it right here, which you saw earlier, okay? <clears throat> Just amazing stuff, guys, amazing. The ancient history that we have is far more, to me, exciting than, uh, than what we're living in right now. To me, what we're living in right now is totally and absolutely boring and mundane. The true ancient history, the true past that we have, to me, is one of the most amazing epics that existed. And I'm looking forward to those times coming back in the future. <clears throat> A lot of people will be long gone. But those times are coming back. The Anunnaki elite make their way to Earth, the fifth tablet. From the planet Lamu, the chariot departed. Toward Earth, the journey it continued. Around the moon, they made circuits, a way station they're on to explore. Around the Earth, they made circuits. Toward a splashdown, slowing. In the waters beside Iridu and Nungal, the chariot bring down. To a quay, by Enlil instructed, they stepped off. Boats were no longer needed. And Lil and Anki, their sister, were embraced greeting. With Nungo, the pilot locked arms. The heroes, male and female, by present heroes were, were shouts greeted. All that chariot had brought was quickly unloaded. Rocket ships and sky ships and tools by Enki designed and provisions of all kind. 450,000 years ago. Okay, 450,000 years ago. <clears throat> Let's look at Enlil's construction plans. On the way in Lil to her, the landscape showed, the Eden extent he showed. From the skies in Lil to her, his plans explained, an everlasting plan I have designed. To her, he was saying, he's talking to his sister, that which I have all time construction shall determine I have laid out. Away from Eridu, where dry land begins, my quarter shall be, La Arsa will be its name. A place for directing it shall become, on the banks of Baranu, the river of deep waters, will it be located? That's in Africa. A twin thereof, a city shall in the future arise. Lagash, I shall name it. Between the two on the plans, a line I have drawn. Sixty leagues or after a healing city shall come into being. A city of your own it shall be. He's given his sisters her own, her own city. Shurabak, the haven city, I shall name it. On the center line it shall be located. To the fourth city it shall be leading, Nibiru Ki. Ki means earth. So they're calling this area Nibiru Ki. So this might, might be where the portal is located or the stargate's located. Earth's crossing place, I will name it. A bond, heaven, earth, in it I shall establish. This is the location of the Duran Ki, where they put the bond, heaven, earth, which was a gate that allowed Enki and Enlil to walk from earth, from earth back to their home planet. The tablets of destinies it shall house, all missions it will control. 
okay? The tablets of destinies it shall house, all missions it will control. It's a control center. With Eridu, five cities there shall be counted to eternity shall exist. On a crystal tablet in Lilta Ninma, the master plan was showing. On the tablet, she saw more markings of them and Lil, she inquired, beyond the five cities, a chariot place I will henceforth build. This is where the portal is located. From Nibiru to Earth, directly to arrive. That's a stargate. That's something you walk straight through from one place to another. <clears throat> and Lil to her was responding. 450,000 years ago, this was uh, written. It's not written, I'm sorry, this was done. This was the estimated time frame that they did this. The texts themselves are probably around 6,000 years old. Well, these stories uh, outline the structure of the universe according to the Babylonian beliefs. Heaven is, is ruled by a god named Anu, the earth by Enlil, and a subterranean sweet water by Ea Enki. The text then explains how the minor gods worked in the fields but then rebelled. As a result, humans are made from clay, saliva, and divine blood to act as servants of the gods. Uh, this is one of the accounts. <clears throat> uh, so Ea Enki is where we get the name Earth. Ki is Earth and Ea is the first two letters of Earth, obviously, so Earth was named after Ea Enki. Ea Enki was supposed to be the king of Earth, but something happened It's not exactly stated uh, but his brother Enlil superseded him and took that kingship. Uh, and unfortunately, that's what happened because Enlil was, was really a brutal guy. Enlil was also known as um, Satan, the Lord of Eden in a lot of ancient cultures. <clears throat> this does not prove a perfect solution as the humans reproduce and their noise disturbs Enlil's sleep. He decides to destroy them with a plague, famine, drought, and finally a flood. Sound familiar, guys? <laughs> However, each time Enki instructs one of the humans Atraasis to survive the disasters. Atraasis is this is now we're talking about Noah. Noah was the son of Enki. He was half human, half uh, Anunnaki. <clears throat> the God gives Atraasis seven days warning of the flood and he builds a boat loaded with his possessions, animals and birds. He subsequently saved while the rest of humankind is destroyed. However, the gods are unhappy as they no longer receive the offerings they used to. The reason why the gods wanted the offerings, by the way, these Anunnaki people, the offerings were how they ate. They tricked humans into doing these sacrifices of animals and offerings and bringing it to them. They would have people lined up. If you go to Egypt and go to Cairo, you will learn this from archeologists. People would line up for miles to bring offerings to the gods. And what were they doing? They were bringing them their food. <clears throat> there is a gap in the text at this point, but it does not end with Atreus making an offering and Enlil accepting the existence and usefulness of humans. Copies of the story have survived from the 17th to the 7th century BC, showing that it was copied and recopied over the centuries. This is the most complete version. There are clear similarities between this flood story and others known in the Mesopotamian literature. For example, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a true and full story of, um, of Noah as well, okay? I highly recommend that people read that. As we're moving more into talking about a little bit about these Atlantean culture before I start showing you proof of life. The history of the Emerald Tablets is very strong and well documented. The original text was written in Thoth's Atlantean language. Uh, the version that I'm referencing in this particular thing, you can get it on Crystal Links, Michael Doriel, or Roger Bacon's version, doesn't matter. A new translation was recently published from the uh, Ara uh, Arabic version of the Emerald Tablets and it's called The Book of Causes by the famous Thomas Aquinas. A translation by Sir Isaac Newton was found among his alchemical papers that are currently housed in the King's College Library at Cambridge University. Philip of Tripoli also translated the Emerald Tablets in 1240 AD. Also a famous version called the Book of the Secret of Creation and the Art of Nature was written in 683 AD. A famous uh, author named Roger Bacon was accepted to Oxford University at the age of 13, also translated and wrote a version of the Emerald Tablets. He was an English philosopher and Franciscan friar who placed considerable emphasis on the study of nature through empirical methods. In the early modern era, he was regarded as a wizard and partly famed for the story of his mechanical or neurocratic brazen head. He is also sometimes credited uh, as one of the earliest European advocates of the modern scientific method inspired by Aristotle and uh, by later scholars such as Arab, the Arab scientist named al Hazen. So these are some credible people that had come in contact with the Emerald Tablets. 
written evidence of the Anunnaki engaging man mankind after a global flood 36,000 years ago. Over the world, then broke the great waters, drowning and sinking, changing Earth's balance. Until the Temple of Light was left, standing on the great mountain of Undal, still rising out of the water. Some there were who were living, saved from the rush of the fountains. These are people who survived the great flood. If you read the Bible, you find that humans survived the great flood, not just Noah, but other people, and also some of the Nephilim survived as well. Call to me then the master saying, gather ye together my people, take them by the arch ye have learned far across the waters until ye reach the land of the hairy barbarians. He's talking about the land of Chem, because Chem had been completely flooded over for at least two generations and the people had now gone to a barbaric stage. Follow there the plan that ye know of. Gather thy then my people and enter the great ship of the master. Now I want, to, I want you to listen to what kind of ship this is. Upward we rose into the morning. They didn't sail out, they went up. Dark beneath us lay the temple. So obviously they're in the sky now. Suddenly over it rose the waters, vanished from earth. They've now left the atmosphere until the time appointed was the great temple. So they finally went to their destination halfway around the planet. Fast we fled toward the morning until beneath us lay the land of the children of Chem. Raging, they came with cudgels and spears, lifted in anger, seeking to slay and utterly destroy the sons of Atlantis. So when he landed his ship in the land of Chem, the people came to attack them when they came out. So look, look what he does. Then I raised my staff and sent the ray of vibration, striking them still as fragments of stone of the mountain. So I used a stun gun 36,000 years ago to stop these people from attacking them. Uh, then he says, uh, then I spoke to them in words calm and peaceful, telling them the might of Atlantis, saying we were the children of the sun and its messengers. Cowed them I by my display of magic science. So he he had them like going crazy when he showed him his little technology, his, like his watch and his other little pieces of technology he had on him. Until my feet, they groveled when I released them. So they fell to his feet like groveling, like think this guy must be a god. Then he said, no, he stopped, he released them. He said, in other words, I'm not, look guys, I'm not a god. Long we dwelt in the land of Cam, long and yet long again, until obeying the commands of the master. In other words, they stayed there till the mission was complete. Who while sleeping yet lives eternally, I sent from me, the sons of Atlantis, sent them in many directions that from the womb of time, wisdom might rise again in her children. So what he's saying here is, uh, after they completed the mission there in the land of Cam and raised them back to a high level of civilization, because they were already there before, but the flood had destroyed everything. Then he sent his crew members around the planet to duplicate what he had done there in the land of Cam. More evidence and proof in ancient, from ancient texts that these people were here they rebuilt civilization after the Great Flood, and that they began to go around the planet and re-kickstart civilizations everywhere, uh, all over again, after this Great Flood happened. So more evidence of a Great Flood and evidence that people were, uh, advanced people were able to travel this planet. No matter where you go on this planet, you will find a depiction of Thoth. I went all the way out into the bush in Australia, and he's etched into the stone in Australia, flying on a spaceship through the Milky Way galaxy, way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, we discovered proto-Sumerian hieroglyphs out in the Australian outback, which are going to be part of the documentary that I'm doing called The Gosford Glyphs, uh, I'm talking, The Mystery of the Gosford Glyphs. That's going to be coming out very soon. Uh, it's well documented that I went there. I posted the images on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and everything else. And we discovered, we didn't discover, I'm sorry, our guides took us to the location of the already discovered proto-Egyptian hieroglyphs, which have now been verified by the Board of Antiquities out of Egypt, that they are proto-Egyptian, so they're real. And the patina inside the, uh, in the glyphs, that grows in the glyphs, can be aged so they date back 4,000 years. So this is real amazing stuff. <clears throat> the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, Tablet 1. Build it, I, the Great Pyramid, pattern after the Earth's force, burning eternally so that it too might remain through the ages. So Thoth said he built the Great Pyramid, not Confred Kufrin or whoever these people are. This is the person that claims to have built the Great Pyramid long before any of these other people were even born, tens of thousands of years before they were born. In it, I built up my knowledge of magic science, that means advanced technology, so that it, I might, so that it might be here when I return from Amenti. I, while I sleep in the halls of Amenti, my soul roams free and will incarnate and dwell amongst men in one form or another, Hermes thrice born. Thoth had the ability to transfer his consciousness into new bodies, avatar bodies that he would create, 
and he would walk amongst men, but he says, unlike a man in other texts. So he was walking amongst us, even though he wasn't a human, he appeared to be a human. He was a ancient being from another planet that learned how to transfer consciousness. These beings had advanced, advanced, advanced technology. Now, based off of my estimates uh, from the animal tablets and uh, the work done on the Sphinx and the uh, pyramid, I started looking into the research of the possibility after folks said he built the Great Pyramid, could it be 36,000 years old? And guess what? Man, this is an amazing guy right here. Unfortunately, he passed away. I think that's what it is. But let's listen to what he has to say. Let's bring this volume up here. How can I get this back to full screen again? There is at least in principle a method of Let me see if I can get this back to full screen from where we are. Hold on, guys. Uh, all right, so. All right. It is. I think that's what it is. There is at least in principle a method of trying to settle this dating question. But my own view is, and is this that it's those older date, partly because the Egyptians themselves say that's where civil, their civilization began, and then partly because of the of the of the I think the very plausible suggestion that the Sphinx is meant as a as a mark of the age of Leo. Now this is another hotbed of controversy, but there's a lot of reason to think that the ancients very, very ancient, knew about the procession of the equinoxes and the shifts of ages, you know, that goes we're now the end of the age of Pisces and coming into the age of Aquarius. And there's plenty of good reason to think that this knowledge of procession goes back into deep, deep antiquity. So if the Sphinx is actually intended as a Leo marker, it only gives you a couple of choices because the last age of Leo is around 10,000, 10,500 BC. This is the date chosen by Boval and Hancock for dating the Sphinx, because everything else aligns. And then if you add to that the probability that the, that the Sphinx is looking, at, is looking at its own image in the sky when it rises against the, uh, the sun at, at the equinox, you've again got this 10,500 date. The problem with that date, as far as I'm concerned, is that in paleoclimatology, you know, and this is, nobody disagrees with this, that the whole Earth is in chaos at that time, following the breakup of the Ice Age, which happens around 12,000 BC, for reasons no one is quite sure. Schott's written a very good book called Voices of the Rocks, where he, it's a kind of a state-of-the-art statement on catastrophe theory. So everybody knows that this catastrophe took place. No one's sure why. That's when all the woolly mammoths died and the woolly rhinoceroses, you know, all the mass extinctions are called the quaternary extinctions. All this took place. So my way of thinking, building all of this incredible stuff, requires a long settled and and stable civilization you don't just build things like this in the midst of of a, of a worldwide global chaotic situation where there are earthquakes all over the place huge floods and everything's you know everything's unstuck so but nevertheless the star alignments work for that 10,500 day but because of these because of these these various these, these, let's say, these mitigating factors, I don't like that date. And, but the next, the only other choice is to push it back another full processional cycle, which is effectively 26,000 years. That gives you 26,000, that gives you 36,000 BC, which corresponds to the Egyptian text themselves. So even though it looks outrageous, particularly to an academic, to me, it's the more plausible of the of the possible scenarios, and it just remains to be seen, you know, if we're able to actually date this thing. But the dating will probably remain conjecture until or unless we're able to put a date to it or other finds somehow or another, if we get permission to come back here with seismographs and radar and stuff like that, and are again able to, you know, we find other, other artifacts underground and we're able to date those by stratification or by finding something that maybe can be carbon dated, who knows? There are a lot of various possibilities, there are a lot of possibilities for, for, for getting to a date. A lot of it really depending upon 
at least a few within the academic establishment saying, yeah, this stuff really has to be looked into. They're never going to say, yeah, we were wrong and you were right. But all I need is enough of a concession that say, this is interesting. Let's put some time and effort into trying to get behind it. We'll see what happens. The age of Leo marks the beginning point of the vast celestial cycles known as the precession of the equinoxes. The Sphinx, as the marker of Leo, demonstrates a knowledge of complex celestial mechanics and the observation of phenomena spanning tens of thousands of years. So there you have it, guys. So when you look at the processional period, um, and you go back one processional period to the alignment of the Sphinx with the constellation of Leo, what he was saying was you find that uh, we're talking about an extinction period of time and also an ice age, not a great time to do, um, you know, to, to build a, a monument like this. Uh, so, you know, you go back before the ice age, you go another processional period. When you add them up, if you look at that 36,000 year time frame, around the same time that Thoth claims to have built the Great Pyramid, it all aligns perfectly. And it seems like the perfect time the, the floodwaters are residing, uh, civilizations are being re kickstarted on the planet Earth. Uh, the Atlantean civilization is reclaiming uh, their capitals around the planet, according to a lot of ancient texts, and, uh, and ruling over certain regions of the planet. Perfect timing to rebuild a lot of these ancient structures. So this was their second time building on this planet megalithic structures and monuments like the Great Sphinx and the Great Pyramid about 36,000 years ago. Everywhere you go on the planet, you're gonna find sphinxes. They exist everywhere. Greece, Egypt, China, India, Assyria. No matter where you go, you'll find um, the sphinx. This is from the movie Prometheus <laughs> on the left. And uh, the one that's the real one for that is the, the one in Romania called the Bushegi Mountain Sphinx. Now the Bushegi Mountain has a very interesting story, which is um, uh, really, really strange. Uh, I did a two-hour documentary on the Bushegi Mountain Sphinx in the Bushegi Mountains. There's a chamber there in the mountain behind this Sphinx that you can't walk into because it's like this invisible force field there. It's documented. It's not, it's not even a hidden thing. It's well known. Only a person with a specific resonant subatomic frequency, which, which means a, blood, a specific bloodline, they have to have the frequency in their body, can walk through that area. And about, I think it was six years ago, somebody was able to walk into that room. Uh, so it's a real interesting documentary. If you wanna take some time, look up the Bushegi Mountain uh, documentary that I did uh, with a few other people about uh, maybe five years ago I did it. It should be on YouTube, it's totally free. We see this, uh, <clears throat> this design and we see, um, it's called a triptych. You see these three windows Mexico, Egypt, Cambodia. We see the three window design. It's called a triptych design, T-R-Y-P, triptych uh, design. And it's prevalent throughout uh, all pyramid designs around the planet. And then we also see from the stars above on the actual mapping that they're roughly around the same parallel around the planet as well. So this is more evidence of, uh, of a global civilization. So when Thoth sent his people out to duplicate what he did in Egypt, that's exactly what they did. They went around the planet and they literally duplicated what he did in Egypt, adding their slight different touch and feel, but overall the same exact architect is behind everything. You'll find pyramids all over the planet, different types of pyramid structures, various shapes, sizes, various types of ziggurats and sun pyramids and moon pyramids and everything else. But no matter, no matter where you go on the planet, every continent, you'll find, you, you will find pyramids. Okay, you'll find them. The Ziggurat of Ur was one of the most famous ones, in my opinion, because the Ziggurat of Ur, top right, is the location that the U.S. military went right after 9-11. The first place they went was to the museum uh, in, in Iraq, and they broke in there, and they stole a lot of antiquities. And then the second place they went to was the Ziggurat of Ur. And when they got to the ziggurat of Ur, they took something from out of there. They took an object that looked eerily like the Stargate from the movie Stargate and put it on the back of a uh, wide, uh, you know, box truck or whatever that is, put a, put a tarp on top of it and pulled off. So one of my friends who was in service at the time took the photos. 
than they're on uh, our Anunnaki history on Facebook. But uh, the thing is that he, he never saw him again. But this is an amazing situation or scenario where they go to the ziggurat. You're supposed to be getting, re, uh, you know, um, you're, try, you're trying to get revenge and you go to a ziggurat and take this giant stone circle <laughs> and you go to a museum. The first two places, that's where they went. There had to be something there that they needed. I think the WMD was a Stargate. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Neil with Portal to Ascension, and I just wanted to take a moment really quick and show you the Portal to Ascension platform. The presentation or the documentary that you just watched was one of our many productions that I've done over the years, created over well over a thousand uh, workshops, events, conferences, retreats, webinars, and this is how our website works. If you want to go ahead and receive not only access to this presentation, uh, but hundreds of other presentations that we have available for you right now for free. You can go to our website, you enter your name right here, you email right here, click sign up. Pretty soon we're going to be launching a new website, but the, the procedure is pretty much the same. You know, your name, email, sign up. Once you do that, you're going to get an email with your username and a temporary password. You then click log in. Once you log in, you're going to see the whole entire back end laid out with all the webinars and presentations for you. Not only can you start typing by speaker name, topic, category, whatever you want, even letter, but you can scroll down this list here and sort by category. And I'm not going to read these off to you, but you can take a look. We have a lot of different topics. You for disclosure, true world history, spiritual development, science, sacred geometry, and so much more. And then you can also search by speaker, which we have here alphabetically, or you can just browse the whole entire thing here and take a look at all these presentations. You are able to, if you can take a look up the top corner here, you're able to add to your watch list to watch these back anytime you want. So you can add to your watch list, it'll be put there. When you come back into the platform, you can continue watching where you left off. There's a documentaries tab, there's an interviews tab, and this is how the individual event page will look. So right now you can go to the website, portaltoascension.org, put in your name and email, sign up, you'll get access to what you just watched, and there's so much more footage. There's free footage being added weekly. So really, this is a one-stop shop for consciousness. And there's always new valid content for you that is relevant for the times that we're currently in, where we're not only dissecting and delving deep into the ancient past, but also creating information that will empower us for the future to come. And here is an example of one of the event pages. This one's on Billy Carson, Quantum Macabre Manifestation. You can view it right there. Description, speaker image. That would also go to his bio and then also suggested webinars that you can tune into as well. And then of course, please do leave a comment and leave us feedback. So there you go, guys, that's our back end, and that's how portal to Ascension works. Go ahead, go to the website right now, portal to ascension.org. It's your name, email, sign up, take a look at the site, let us know what you think and enjoy.